Welcome to PTG TV. This is your host, Antonio Hicks, aka Escaping the Matrix, and my co host, Miss Tamika Day. In today's Real Talking Conversation, we have Miss May Muna Freeman of SMAC, Stone Mountain Action Coalition, a new organization that hopes to bring changes to Stone Mountain Park. One being to replace the Confederate flags on the park grounds and have more representation of Native and African Americans, as well as put more emphasis on ecology, geology, and wildlife at the park itself. Welcome to the show, May. Looking forward to hearing more about SMAC and, and who you are and what it is that you do. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here and talk. So if you can give us a brief, I mean, because I read over your bio and everything, if you can give us a brief introduction as to who you are, who is me. And first of all, I love your name, May Moonham. I right. love the name. It just sounds like we're supposed to be ready to go, right? Yes. What does your name mean? Let me let me get that. What does your name mean? Bring us some energy. Absolutely. It means truthful and trustworthy in the Arabic language. Okay. Yes. That's powerful. Very popular in West Africa. Yes, but um, my name is Maymuna Freeman, and I am a co-founder of SMAC, Stone Mountain Action Coalition. And I have been a lifelong activist, um, and I always tell people I began as a Girl Scout, learning how to be empowered as a young girl, how to affect change in the real world. And that turned into, you know, civic work, and then as I got older, it became political work. So I've worked a lot of campaigns, um, a lot of advocacy for um, health care, as well as social justice work. And so um, it evolved into um, racial uh, equality work uh, as it relates to these Confederate monuments. So now, are you originally from Georgia? I'm from... Yes, I'm from Georgia. Absolutely. I'm a Southern peach. Um, my family's from Athens originally. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. Uh, there's a plantation out in uh, Washington Wilkes County that's a Freeman plantation. And I'd always like to believe that I had the name Freeman because my ancestors had chosen it um, as an alternative to a slave name. Mm -hmm. But it just happens to be that, you know, my folks probably more than likely came from the Freeman Plantation. There is a Confederate monument in Crawford, uh, Lexington, Georgia, in Oglethorpe County. And there are three uh, patriarchs of Freemans who died during the Civil War. So, yes, I am absolutely, completely, truly Southern. No, so I wouldn't go say. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead to me. Wait, so the plantation that's in Washington, what is it, Washington Wilkes in between that area? You know, that's a part of that picture, because it all ties in, where him, you know, I'm sorry, I can't say his name on our show. Antonio has been banned the name. That's really um, The governor who resides <laughs> <laughs> over Georgia, <laughs> resides over Georgia. That's where they took that um, that picture that they were signing into law. It was in front of the plantation there in Washington. The so, so the irony that you mentioned that and what we're about to talk about, yeah. So if you do a little research on that picture when they were signing it, and you know it happens to be a plantation in the background, you know, constantly trying to remind us of what was taken and stolen from us. Because I like to always remind people. We didn't give it away. It was taken and it was stolen, you know? Yes. So that just kind of kind of tied in. It just made me really think about that as you mentioned um, your family history. Absolutely. Yeah, she she know how I feel about that. I don't, they don't deserve the respect of giving those, those titles they have, especially 45. I will never give them that respect because they didn't earn it and they will not get it from me or on this show. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Right. I is it's not gonna happen. Same thing as the one prior to him in uh deal. You won't get that at all, especially when you get on TV. You know, calling people colored. So, yeah, right, exactly. But yes, yeah, a great history. It's always good to talk to people who are from Georgia. Very rare, you know. Do we have a lot of our own activists? A lot of times, people are coming here. Antonio and I are both from Macon, Georgia. So we understand the similar path of why we talk a lot about politics and why it's so important in 
you know, hearing our voices and being seen, and especially as a younger generation, sometimes mm -hmm. we still feel like it's only um, Congressman John Lewis, you know, um, or Al Sharpton. What about the new um, younger people that's been in this fight for the last 20 years, especially if you went to a PWI, a predominantly white institute, people just don't know um, the layers and the barriers that we've all had to go through in order to just be who we are and to use our voice. So we thank you for joining us. Right. And I'm not saying that, you know, if you come on here that you have to be from the South to really understand the struggles oh, no. of us from the South. But it I helps. just like, yeah, I just like hearing it from people in the, just part of the Bible Bill. Like if you're from Georgia, especially from Georgia, because, you know, being from Georgia, you know, we, we, it's a lot of hardships here that we've all had to deal with growing up, especially in our age bracket. And people like to think that it's only the older generation that had to deal with some of the racist activities. But no, it's not them, especially a lot of us that grew up around Stone Mountain. Cause like I was telling you, Miss May, when we were out there, some of the, uh, the, the stand, stand ins is that, you know, they would have the Confederate reenactments there. And I was there one time with my whole family and I was getting called everything on the sun of being threatened and told if I didn't leave right then and there, they were going to take us out. So that's why I was like, this was important for me. So I'm asked, what what made you want to lay on a cross for this? Go well, on the sword, not even on the cross, on the sword. Lay on the cross. Oh, come on, Tony, don't put it down. <laughs> yes. Um. It. Okay. The fact is that white supremacy invades every aspect of Southern culture, and we have a really hard time naming it white folk and black folk we have a hard time naming it um we tend to in the south i think be polite and try to work around things and maybe even to a certain extent compromise and i have gotten to a point where there was a place in my life i grew up in a predominantly white area upper upper class environment outside of augusta uh, called Columbia County. And in order to survive, in order to even socially thrive, you had to learn how to hear black jokes or even compliments like the bus driver telling you, you look cute for a little black girl, things like that. I had to tolerate that growing up. And so I always held in my heart a place for brother W.E.B. Du Bois. I recognized exactly his struggle. And I love the way that he focused on black greatness and black genius. And he said, I will be better because you think I'm less. I will run faster than you. I will get better grades than you. You know, I took on a healthy perspective about myself as an African-American as a result of being in a predominantly white area yeah. and growing up and, and going to private schools and things like that, where I was the only black kid. And so, there's these two worlds that I exist in. Um, and, and as he says, double consciousness, I'm very aware of it. I would say I have triple consciousness um, because I also have to see how black folks see me as who I am in addition to that. And so in that healthy blackness and black consciousness that I developed, I also have my white side and I call it my white side because there's a part of me that is privileged and entitled and it's outraged by the barriers that's placed on me by race. And so I'm kind of in a unique position because I think I assert that um, this aggressive, won't take it, can't take it, don't stop, won't stop, won't quit attitude. And so I started to apply that to my um, interactions as an activist. And so when I saw these uh, Confederate monuments and I started seeing how they bring together people around hate. I recognize that and I saw this is not okay. And I really do in my heart of hearts, I believe the civil rights movement was black folks fighting for themselves. At this point, I really feel that white folks need to be checking white folks. That's yeah. where I'm at right now. And that's the new work to me that needs to be done. I think that black folk can help in that process and we can help them see what whiteness is help them recognize white privilege. But more than anything, and I think we're even seeing it in media. We're seeing it at the Capitol. We're seeing, we're seeing that. We're seeing white folk have to check white folk. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing them have to say to each other, that's whiteness, that's privilege, you know, and they have to do the work. 
So I think that's where we are. And I know that's part of the role that I have um, to play in fighting the, the Confederacy. And it's, it's interesting you say that because a lot of people wouldn't understand that it's, that's not from the South, how we have to compromise who we are just to survive. Because even in the workplace, and we saw a lot of that when people were trying to, we were passing laws just so people wouldn't fire us because of our hair. And we, we were in dreads, like you have dreads, wearing dreads to work and in the office. And I was, I had this conversation last night with my own account session. And the whole thing was dealing with cultural barriers in the workplace. And that's one of the things I had to deal with when I got into corporate America is I had to reform, retrain my entire self and change my entire self to fit the image of what they believe I should look like so I can thrive in the workplace and move up. And so a lot of people outside of the South, the, the, the Bible Belt, I don't think they get that because they will say, oh, I wouldn't do this and I wouldn't do that. And they, you know, they're going to have to make me. And I'm like, well, you wouldn't have a job in most cases. Or <laughs> you would have somebody coming after you to cause you bodily harm. Absolutely. Or just like what you said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a chocolate girl from the South. You're pretty to be chocolate. Oh my God. If I had some money for every time I heard that, right? So, and then I was raised that because I was dark skinned, I had to be smart. So you're mm -hmm. right. When you grow up in that type of environment where you play softball, and you're the only one on the team that look like you. You're the only one on the traveling team. When your mom even tell you your white family is here to pick you up, it becomes, you know, it, it's good and bad because you learn to adapt. You learn to adjust. You learn that, especially when you get older, there are some rooms where you sit in and you're the only person that look like you. And I mean, and it's and the only woman. Sometimes you're Amen. the only woman and mm -hmm. the only black woman and the only black person. So I'm going to say those things taught me how to know when to be when. And that's what I try to motivate and encourage young people, knowing how to turn it on and turn it off. But sometimes that inner being of who you are as an African-American woman from the South, you have to cut into people a little bit professionally and they don't always seem to like it. And I had that experience at work. Like it's, it's about to turn into a book. I haven't been in corporate. This corporate life for me, it's been difficult because I'm used to being my own boss. I'm used to being an entrepreneur. So trying to adjust and make people feel comfortable, I'm not here for it. You're not going to be comfortable. I'm going to make you uncomfortable. You know, so when people say those little snide remarks that they don't think are snide remarks, I, I politely repeat them back to them. Oh, you have good taste. What does that really mean? Do I have good taste for a black person? You know, I'm starting, <laughs> or do I just like nice? Like, which one is it? So I feel where you're going with this. And that's why removing those Confederate flags and monuments and statues, it is important. But then here's a question that I have for you. Let's say we get them removed. What are the other works that we have to do once those statues come down? Because a lot of people don't even know the history of what's going on and especially in the South, and especially, you know, we have so many people now who've moved to Georgia. So they just come seeing black power, um, black wealth, money. And then they get here and they're like, I thought it was all fun and games. What do you mean I can't get a business license? What do you mean I can't? Now you're telling me I can't vote in line. So what mm -hmm. works once we get those statues removed, we just got one removed in Douglas County, Georgia a few months ago. So we're excited about it. And the great grandson of the, the gentleman who was the statue, the Confederate statue, he agreed that it needed to come down. Like these things that my grandfather did was horrible. So as we're talking about that, what are some things that you see we're going to have to do once those statues come down to help break these barriers? Absolutely. And um, and I want to I relate totally to your experiences in the workplace. I want to say that first and foremost. Um, and I have found that sometimes being extra professional, being highly educated, it makes folks more uncomfortable than if you acted like you didn't have sense. You know, if you break mm -hmm. all stereotypes, they get very uncomfortable. Um, so absolutely. Th this is also, I think, the work that must be done. And I'll go back a little bit to 2000. And 17, you all are very aware of Charlottesville and what happened there. And that triggered me. And that's when I began my work. Uh, I guess I would say my career um, working to dismantle the Confederacy here in Georgia and the South. 
I was so disturbed I could not sleep. Um, I was a member, or I have, I am a continuing member of Indivisible, the Indivisible Army, which is a political organization, a progressive organization. And I'm very dedicated to uh, to this organization. And as a, as a member of that organization, I saw the extension of the Obama era, where people learned to connect to each other, house to house, person to person, meeting um, new people, all different races, and getting the work done. Grassroots, true grassroots. And as a result of my disturbance by what I watched in Charlottesville on TV, I called up one of my indivisible um, comrades and I said, you know what? I can't, we can't, we can't just watch this. We can't just let this go. I know we're not even in the same state, but we have to have a response. And so I think it was within 24 hours, we mobilized the whole community. And down in Decatur Square, we pretty much hosted a, a Stands with Charlottesville uh, vigil. And I was only expecting maybe 30 people to show up. And it was hundreds, it was hundreds and hundreds. And I was conducting what I understood to be in my own mind, a group ritual. And when I say a group ritual, I, I simply mean, um, I wanted and the people who participated to show up and declare that all people have humanity. And I had written a very um, long, but powerful, I think, um, declaration speech for everybody to repeat. And I give, I had a bunch of candles, white candles, and I asked everybody to dress in white. And I wanted us to come together. And I was just so surprised to see crowds and crowds of just mostly white faces. Um, Cause the cater had changed so much. And I, I don't think I was aware of it since I had uh, left Agnes Scott College where I went to school. And I was really surprised. I was surprised at the number of people as well as how many um, white people cared. And the media came, it was much bigger of an event than I ever expected. It was uh, at least 12 media outlets there all the local channels and they asked me something and I and I struggle with that to this day what I said and then I've come full circle and so to answer your question they asked me they said do you care about the fact that there's a confederate monument right here in front of this courthouse it's standing right here what do you have to say about that and I looked at it and I knew for a fact that I had never even been aware of that confederate monument the day before it was a white woman who called me up and she said, why would you hold a rally like that for healing and hope in front of a Confederate statue? And I told her I wasn't aware of it because I told her, you know, black folk don't walk around reading all these different uh, obelisk and random things. We don't memorize where these things are. And so I told her, I said, I don't care about that concrete. I care about how people treat each other. That's what I care about. And so when the media asked me exactly that same question, what about this right here? I said in that moment, because that was what I really felt, that it's about how people treat each other. We have to come together as a community and actually recognize each other's humanity. I care more about that than I do about the concrete. And so I'm quoted in the media saying that. And I've evolved my ideas about what I said at that time. And I realized that no, it does matter. The concrete does matter. These symbols do matter, the flags do matter, because what happens is you have white supremacists and hateful Nazi, all kinds of different people that come together around these symbols and they turn it into something else. And we saw that at the Capitol. So that's my answer. We got to treat each other with humanity. But I don't think that was not done on purpose. See, I think subconsciously, God in the universe put you out in front of that thing to show you and to show everybody of what the past is and what we should be today so it's not about you didn't care about the concrete i think you were meant to be there to show that the past had to be gone and the only way we can truly heal ourselves is to actually look like we look right here out today gather in unity to make a change for the greater good of all humanity and all the people around this state and this country that's my belief you know, I get a little deep with things. <laughs> That's my I believe. Because I'm like, and I'm listening to how she responded, and I know what she means because she's feeling it in her gut. Like, hmm, I wasn't aware. 
And the reason right. why you wasn't aware, because it's one of those things, like, it's so subtle, right? Mm -hmm. When you were going to build a Martin Luther King statue, we knew all about the one that was in Washington, D.C. Before it came, they were asking you to donate money and to be a part of the unveiling and all of that. These things snuck up on us at a time they were implanted or built at a time when we still didn't have a voice, right? Mm -hmm. No one cared about your opinion about this concrete monument. So it is important because it lives there, it resides there. And really, I'm probably just fast on my feet. <laughs> I probably would have got caught off guard too. But just as you said it and I'm thinking about it, you know, we, we are here because this is the reason what's happening in Charlottesville. It's because of these statues and these monuments that people mm -hmm. worship this. They worship, you know, it's the same thing what happened with Drew Brees. He didn't realize that we're thinking about his grandfather and how negative <laughs> the war that his grandfather was a part of was going to start and help his and hurt his career, you know, a little bit, you know, we know how they can give it, but just how it started the conversation because they don't feel it the same way that we feel it. It just doesn't for them. It has the same white power that you talked about earlier. And it says, we are elite. We are better than you. We are above you. Um, you are slaves. You are nothing, you know, and that's really what it symbolizes. And so that's why we have so much um, strife and we're trying to figure out, and it goes all the way to now, trying to decide what schools your kids go to, whether to put them in public or private. You just said you grew up in private school, you know, it has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. I'm one of those parents that struggle, you know, public school, private school, am I better, am I not better, but I'm free. You know, I get to make those choices. And then look at your last name, wow. <laughs> Famous, yes. I mean, the, the the thing that that gets me the most is is that how comfortable people are in expressing how they do like the monuments and the statues. Because even when we did a protest, I forget who, I think it was Gwinnett County Democrats and some other people. Like when we did a um a, a silent protest at the uh, ice thing they had last year at the courthouse, and it was trying to have Gwinnett County stop you know acting on behalf of ice. They actually had people from the county get up and speak. And a lot of the older people were talking about how they are, they are in agreement with the police doing ice work and getting some of the people out of the area because nothing but criminals. And they said they can remember how safe it was 40 and 50 years ago in Gwinnett County. And I'm like, <laughs> in my seat. So it's hard for me to be quiet. Miss May, you didn't see you, you see the tame side of me right now. Uh, Hicks used to be real outspoken. He used to go in because I would I would have got kicked out today. They probably would have locked me up. I'm working because, on him. I'm coaching because to me, <laughs> growing growing up here, when somebody tells me how great some place is, especially coming out of Stone Mountain, how great some place is 40 years ago, and I'm like, hmm, you your experience was totally different from mine because I remember Gwinnett County before Gwinnett County became diverse, and in Loganville where I live at, it was a ton of Klan people out here, and you couldn't you wouldn't say if I here as a black person. So I was like, so. No, you, what you're saying is <laughs> you don't like the diversity and you don't like how it's become right now. And you wanted to go back how we used to be. And the same thing about Stone Mountain. So I went to Facebook and like I saw one of the comments when you posted up there about your, what you were doing with Smack and trying to get changes done. And somebody posted in there saying, well, we like the way things are. And if you don't like it, then you can just leave the Stone Mountain area. And I'm like, well, what do you like about it? I'm like, because mm. for us, if you're not black and you're not used, because they still have Confederate reenactments up at Kennesaw Mountain. So I'm like, so you if you never experienced the, the angst and the pain that we had, of course you're gonna like it. But you come and walk in, in our shoes. Like now, we saw how they feel when they get a little pushback. They storm capitals. When they can't get their way, they go in, they 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 hold up places with guns across the nation, not just in one place, across the nation. We can't do that because if we do stuff like that, they show up in military uniforms with snipers and stuff everywhere. Ready, and we saw that with the civil rights movement, and you would think that, oh. You know that was back then they won't do this now they still do it to this day so i'm glad that you're like I've, i told you and i'm gonna keep telling you i'm glad you're doing what you're doing because you're doing it coming from outside of stone mountain you're all the way from up in the athens area <laughs> and i got stories about athens too <laughs> and you're doing <laughs> oh, all the way to stone mountain and i grew up there and you would think that's something that you know i would have got involved in once i got into politics but i didn't because i was you know like we said i got comfortable with it and i was like it's kind of is what it is because i don't foresee any change taking place because of the people that's in power right now so i'm gonna say you know thank you again and yeah, athens yeah athens is a trip 
Ooh, that was the trip. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that. You know, and the, the crazy thing is, um, after the Decatur Monument, there was a lot of uh, different things that happened, a lot of um, different protests. and and But more than anything that came out of it, Hate Free Decatur is an organization I was part of. And Hate Free Decatur basically was given birth to on that day when uh, we had the stand with Charlottesville. It was birthed that day, literally. And that is the organization that did most of the work in conjunction with the NAACP and some other groups and Beacon Hill. And so there's, there was an evolution of different hands on this project. Um, and I started moving towards the big one, from Decatur to the big one. And that was Stone Mountain Park for me. I've been a patron of the park for the past 10 years. I literally live like one street over from the line that is Stone Mountain. Um, I'm living on Lithonia Stone Mountain, so it's very close. I can literally see the mountain from my backyard. Um, I see it every day. I, I, I move past it uh, on my way to work when I was working at Stone Mountain High School um, for DeKalb County. I was always around the mountain. And if anybody who lives around the mountain, you know your phone cuts off when you go around the mountain. So mm -hmm. the mountain has been something I couldn't ignore. And I happened on one fine day on West Park Place to pull up and I saw a whole bunch of, I don't know what I want to call these gentlemen. Hmm. Just that, just that. Just that. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it there. You call them gentlemen. <laughs> just call them gentlemen. I'm going to call them gentlemen with rednecks. And they, <laughs> they uh, pulled up beside my car. And I've been in Black Atlanta so long. And I live in, in, in Lithonia and areas that are, are, are really, really black. So when you see someone who's not looking like yourself, even just in quick trip, you just kind of look like, what you doing over here, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of environment I've been living in for a while. And so I always take notice when I see something that's out of the, uh, you know, kind of unusual. And these young men, I mean, these, these, these gentlemen, they pulled up in a pickup truck, had dirt all over it, big old uh, tires. And they had like four rebel flags. I don't know if this was Confederate history. Month. I don't know what it was, but the weather was nice. And they were blasting some kind of uh, country music. And they just looked like, you know, Dukes of Hazard right here in this predominantly black community. And I remember one of them was chewing tobacco and he was kind of spitting and he spit close to my car. And I'm at the stoplight right there. And I thought to myself, this isn't, this don't feel right. This doesn't feel good. And I pulled my, you know, and as a part of me, like, I'm in Black Land, I ain't got to deal with this. But I was actually, like, my heart started beating. I was like, what if they say something to me? What if they do something? I, I just don't know. I, I imagine them jumping off the truck. I just pulled my car up about six extra feet. It was kind of obvious that I was uncomfortable parked beside them at this stop sign. And at that time, I realized that, there, that this park was attracting a element. Right. And I started looking into it even more and I found out that they were having uh, permits. The park was given permits to, uh, I guess you would say pro, they call it Unite the Right, but it's mm -hmm. pretty much pro-Confederacy, neo-Nazis, three percenters, hate groups. And I was outraged. And I saw the police came because there were anti-protesters um, at this Unite the Right. And there were people throwing rocks and they had to call the police in. And this was a park that I had a black Labrador. I would go to the garden trail every day, every other day. And I made a deal. I said, I can ignore the Confederacy if I can just go in through this one gate. Don't drive around. Don't see anything. Don't look at the laser show. Don't watch the carving. Don't spend any money. I'm just going to go in here, drive in this way and then drive back out. And then I don't have to deal with it. And I'm seeing all these other black folks. So that's something we got to talk about. What do black people really feel and why are we patrons of that park? Because we don't know the history and we don't know even until we started really engaging and having this conversation, I didn't understand why I shouldn't go, right? Besides it's far and I'm like, oh, that's too far. I don't want to go to Stone Mountain. Okay. But besides that, that's not a reason enough, right? But now listening to this, I just think about um, the conferences that we have with our sororities and different groups that I'm in, you know, how people rent it out. And oh, you go to weddings there. I just think a lot of times my people perish for lack of knowledge. We do not know. And when we do not know, there's, we just don't know. You know, now, am I ever going back? 
you know, I, I understand that because I have a sense of awareness to it. It's not a big deal for me, you know. We're not signing up for the field trips. We're not promoting that, mm -hmm. you know. So I understand it in that way. But that's also because I'm engaged, right? And you know, that's my soapbox. I'm always telling people to get engaged and to know what's going on in and outside of their community and especially in Georgia. So I think there's just so much lack of knowledge that we just not taught that about Georgia history, right? What are we taught about Georgia history? Martin Luther King, go to the Martin Luther King Center and, you know, visit and Martin Luther King was from Georgia and he died and we know about Auburn Avenue. That's most people, Mm -hmm. when you think about um, civil rights and the movement is Ebenezer. That's pretty much as far as it goes. I'm, I'm being serious. You still have people you can start asking even in our age group, 40 and up. Well, that's me telling your age group. I'm not sure how old you are. but um, I'm 43. <laughs> okay, yeah. So you can ask people who from Atlanta, from Georgia. You ever been to the Martin Luther King Center? No, I ain't never been. What you mean? You haven't been to the King Center, you know? Mm -hmm. So as we talk about this and I have these conversations with people, you would be surprised to what they do not know even in their own community. You know, right now we're still dealing with, I live in Douglas County and some of the recent history that we found out is that it was named after Frederick Douglass. Oh. Yes. And so they found that out. And so actually it's an um, event coming up where one of the ladies wrote a book called The Ghost of Douglas County, the ghost of Frederick Douglass, which is like D-O-U-G-L-A-S-S. -S. So they end up kind of finding a Caucasian man, last name Douglas. Basically, they implanted him in the city, named the city after him, all of that. And this is like 45 minutes from you. So, you know, and unless you're in this city and you're a part of that culture, you wouldn't even know that, yes, Douglas County was founded and a part of the history started with Frederick Douglass, that's crazy, you know? So that's why it's so important to be engaged and to know what's going on. And so they're, they've really been talking about changing the name. Now you, now you, now let's see this uproar in a couple of, you know, sessions coming up. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I think Tamika, <laughs> Tamika too nice. I, it, I mean, I would say it is the, the ignorance, but I will say people have become complacent because it's like, even with voting, it was like, well, what's the, you know, what can we do? So I'm just gonna go up in and enjoy this, this rock and go hack up the mountain and go around the mountain for some exercise. And I'm just gonna ignore the Confederate names around mm -hmm. on the, the street signs and then the monument itself too, because we showed up. I mean, I did it. We showed up for the laser light show, not thinking that it's racist as hell. And so I'm like, we, that's the thing we have become complacent. Now you have people that are more cognizant of it. Are they gonna start patronizing? No, you know, we're terrible at boycotting. I was as a black people, all y'all listening, yes, we are terrible at boycotting. And so this whole movement going on right now with SB202, shut it up. Y'all not boycotting no Walmart. Y'all not boycotting no Coca-Cola. Y'all not, because you couldn't even boycott the NFL. So <laughs> don't even, don't even, I'm sorry about getting my soapbox. Don't even give me I, that. I'm about to get you in a minute. Don't, don't give me that. Oh, we going to boy, you not, boy, we're terrible at boycotting. They're not. You, you, you're terrible they're not, they're not gonna boycott. I'm not going to Walmart. I'm not going to Walmart. I don't care about 202 or nothing. I'm not going nowhere where it's 45 lines and two people working. That's just me. <laughs> I'm just not going, I'm not going because of that. <laughs> so, I mean, that's why, because I mean, I go to the park and, I, and I, I'm big on history and I still go to the park, but I go to the park for exercise. And I, but I do. But why do you go to that park? So let's talk about it. Let me but it's a, you. So it's a, no, it, because it's the closest thing to me. So I've never okay. really, I've never really lived someplace. Like, well, I mean, even still though, there are no big parks here that people can go to without being reminded of and having PTSD reminded of our, our past. Like I said, Kennesaw Mountain, you got Kennesaw Mountain and they still do Confederate reenactments at Kennesaw Mountain. Is Kennesaw Mountain beautiful? It is beautiful. Is it historic? It is very historic. You can see, what is it like? Six states at the top of the mountain. Kennesaw Mountain is beautiful, but do I need to be reminded of how they treated black folks? No, I don't need to hear about that crap. Let it be in the books. It's like the same thing I said, Ms. Man, let, let it be in the books. If I want yep. to read about history, let that crap be in the books. Don't don't let, don't have me come up here and I still gotta have flashbacks to PTSD. Because how do you tell me to forget about something and my family wasn't a part of it, even though a lot of us from the South, our family history was a part of slavery, but you tell me to forget about something, but you constantly reminded me of it when you put it in my face. 
So how can I forget about slavery if I'm reminded of how people were treated in slavery and he fought a war for slavery? So I can't forget about it. If you're from the South, you really can't forget about it because you suffer from, we suffer from PTSD, we're reminded of it constantly. Because if we weren't reminded of it, you wouldn't see what they did with SB202. Because right. it's like, you showed up to vote and because you showed up to vote, now they want to make changes to election laws and penalize people for, and yes, it's trivial and as stupid as it is, penalize people for handing out water. Tamika and I talked about it and we think it's dumb, it's a carrot that's hanging out in place, but still to be that petty, yeah. To want to pay, to make some make handing out water a misdemeanor for giving water, so get and I try to have a. Goes, you know they minimize us, right? So they minimize us to think you know you know how we've been taught food and water, give them food and water, right? Give them you know no shelter. So when they minimize us, it goes back to what uh, Ms. Freeman said earlier. We've always felt that, right? And anything to just dehumanize mm. African Americans. You can walk in different places now. And they, they even have water out for dogs outside of their restaurants and their places of business. Mm -hmm. And you mean to tell me you don't want to give anybody wow. in line? I don't know why you think it's just black people that's in line. You think black people are the only one with diabetes? You know what, I showed this real, uh, Ms. Freeman. There's some other people with health issues and concerns too. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, so you can give a dog water that you don't even, you know, touch or feel but then you're saying to us, we're not as important. Let's let's make them uncomfortable. That's really what it's about. Everything yes, is about yes. minimizing the African American race, making us uncomfortable, making us feel devalued. So what's all we've been talking about? Then you bring in the George Floyd trial. So now we're gonna keep on dehumanizing. I'm gonna tell you the conversation I had yesterday because I'm the boss woman. I said, don't let this be a distraction. Fill out your PPP. Get your EIDL loan, get your money. This is not gonna, a lot of this is not gonna change until we are able to start owning our own communities, building our communities, until we have the education um, backing, until we start funding our own schools, until we, until we stop waiting on a handout from someone else and we're able to start giving a hand up, we are going to continue to feel some of um, what's happened in America. So, that's my mm, absolutely. Absolutely. I hear I mean, that. Because look at Stone Mountain. I mean, like you just said, you live in Stone Mountain, Latonia. I grew up off of Rita and Road, and then we moved down to, off, move into, uh, off of South Deshaun and North Deshaun. So you talking South about Deshaun. Har Harrison and Stone Mountain, Latonia Parkway. <laughs> so, it, but now it's a predominantly black area now, but it still reminds you of the Confederacy. Cause you would have thought after all this time and then them appointing their first black mayor out there in Stone Mountain, that maybe, you know, we might want to clean some of this up. Mm -mm. No, we still gonna let you know what place you belong in. Yeah, you can live out over here and we can do white flight and take all the money out and take it to another part of the county, but you still gonna recognize your place. But every time but you we come still back- have ownership. Right. We still have ownership. So it's, I'm sorry, Ms. Freeman. I tell you, we keep, like, okay. like to me said, we keep it real on here. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> real, it. it's real. Because I'm like, is is, and that's the thing that I get frustrated with us about, is that we don't, we don't do enough, and we become so complacent with it. And like I said, even with this SB 202, it's a distraction because we're gonna use it as another excuse to say, well, you know, why should we show up to vote? Because they keep doing everything they can to try to kick us down. Why do we need to show up? I'm like, this is all the more reason why you should show up. What you're doing is more reason why people should show up for protests because we've been reminded of this everywhere we go that we they try to keep let us know that we may be free but we're not free because like to me say until we have ownership until we have some form of of monetary power you still can't do anything yeah you can have a protest yeah we can get out and march on the streets but even like in the conversation that you and i had a couple of days ago until we actually show up into the boardrooms and we actually implement some change in policy no, you're not free. You only just give it a little bit for you to, to, to live off of and to have some enjoyment of life. But you won't know what true freedom is until we make the change necessary to benefit us as a people. Absolutely. And I'm going to talk about, <laughs> before we end uh, this conversation, I want to talk about what new revolutionary changes are coming and a real change in power structure. Because you know what, Antonio, at the end of the day, you're right. Who sits at the table? That's who matters. That's where the power is. Mm -hmm. If you can't get to the table, if you back out there in the parking lot, you don't matter. 
you got to be in the boardroom at the table with the pen. And so that's one of the things that we did at SMAC that's different than a lot of other groups who have approached. There's individuals, there's all kinds of different people who've approached this issue of Stone Mountain Park. We've had protests, we've had marches, we've had all kinds of different people uh, have symposiums, I mean, discussions. It's been a whole lot of different things that have people have done. And first and foremost, I'm going to go back to what you said, Antonio. You go to the park because you love the park itself and the space. Mm-hmm. And I decided the same thing. That's my park. When I realized that was a state park, no, that's our park. And you can't have our park because we own our park. What I'm going to need you to do is expel the Confederacy. That doesn't belong in our park. And so SMAC had to really do some grappling when we first got together because there were people who wanted to protest. There were people who wanted to, um, you know, do social media campaigns and attack, attack, attack. And I'm like, no, we're going to attack this thing at the boardroom. We're going to get our pins and put our suits on and we're going to go. Matter of fact, we're going to introduce ourselves. I signed every person in SMAC to a member of the SMMA. This is your new partner. This is your buddy. Your job is to talk to them like a human. Get them to understand and see you as a person, understand where you're coming from. And you try to understand where they're coming from only so that you can get them to do what's right. And let them know that we're here to help them. Because this change is going to be revolutionary. They're going to need more than these 12 old white folks, you know, sitting in in this table. And we're going to make some room. I need a couple of y'all to push a couple of them over and make some room at the table for the rest of us people of color. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And um, before SMAC, I've been working on this for three years by myself. And in 2020, I was part of the uh, march to the NAA, with the NAACP going to Stone Mountain to protest. It was very big. Uh, the Divine Nine and the NAACP DeKalb. And in the middle of that, I said, okay, y'all, it's time. George Floyd has happened. There's this, you know, this, this consciousness raising. It's time for me to get my group because I had done a lot of behind the scenes work with the SMMA, quietly working to influence change. And I got a lot of things done. They stopped giving permits to the racist uh, groups. Um, they decided to close the park when the racist groups decided they wanted to come. Even Super Bowl weekend, the park mm-hmm. shut down. That was because I kept pressing. Are you going to let the racist win? You didn't give them a permit. We made progress. Now, are you going to let them force themselves to come in anyway? What are y'all going to do? And the executives of the park told me, we got it. We got it. I said, y'all, please don't let these people think that this is the new way. Just invade and do what you want anyway. They cl- they shut the park down completely. And that meant they took their power. And so I started to see how building that relationship could mean something. And so when I um, went, I'm on Facebook Live on DeCap, in, in one of the Facebook um, DeCap groups. And I basically said, I want to build a coalition. I want to build a coalition of people who are going to bring their professional abilities and we are going to change the Confederacy. We're going to remove it. And we're going to take back our park because that's my park. And it was a very short film. But before you know it, there were 20. There were 20. And among us lobbyists, um, Ryan Gravel, he's a, a internationally well-known city uh, planner, urban designer. Um, among us are with three, four attorneys, people who work down at the Capitol, Indivisible, NAACP, Atlanta, and the cap presidents. I mean, this became something else and it's constantly expanding. And we have given um, a new energy to the work that needs to be done. We came in suits, we came in high heels, we came uh, with uh, pamphlets. We came with a plan. This is how you change this part. We came and we even broke down their financials and told them you see you're losing don't you open records request and to the point where the sons of the confederacy they brought their lawyer o'toole in and he has um we found through an open records request he and the sons and the confederate daughters and the sons of the confederates they're extremely intimidated by smack they've said they've called us the taliban in suits <laughs> they've nicknamed us that that's in public record to a letter to governor kemp <laughs> I'll take Excuse that. me, the man who. <laughs> right, don't say yes, his name don't. on our show. <laughs> the man who's that sitting office. at the Capitol. Okay? <laughs> that, that one. That one. <laughs> that one. That's right, that one. So, anyway, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, getting a seat at the table. We actually managed to get a full hour, um, just us and them, 
Um, we introduced ourselves. We transfer our business cards. We asked them, what do you think about our presentation? Um, and it's kind of like there's a working relationship, but we are extremely militant about our stands. This is our park. We're not changing. And I've told them a thousand times, I'm not going anywhere. So I consider myself, before I met Smack and even now, the mountain guard. I'm the female version. <laughs> I'm going to be there. And I've called, the, I've called the park many times on groups that I know that were going to come and act up and things like that. So I've been helpful to them in some ways. And I also I was able, before I met um, the people in SMAC and we collaborated, <laughs> I did go to the SMMA meetings and I told them, I said, you guys, look around this park. This whole park is people of color. Mm hmm and look at your advertising. Who are you advertising to? They actually, Carolyn Meadows, who's the uh, NRA uh, president, she says to me, well, we cater to white soccer moms. I said, well, look around. Do you do you see white soccer moms? You have, this is why the races come here. They don't know this is a black community. They don't know that most of your patrons are black and Asian and, and Latin. And I've seen whole Indian families in pavilions, beautiful saris having a, a reunion, you see mm -hmm. the whole world, you know? And I propose to them that when they start taking this Confederacy stuff down, they need, and eventually need to have a children of the world playground so that adults can watch children play and see that that shit does not matter. All right. No. Love it. So let me ask you this, how, how do you stay engaged? Like you said, I'm able to tell them. So tell our listeners, because that's one of the things I'm big on. What are ways that people can get involved with your organization as well as what should they do if they're outside of the Stone Mountain, Latonia area, but want to get involved in civil and social action in their community? <clears throat> in terms of supporting SMAC, we are not even a nonprofit. I don't know what we are. We, we call ourselves a ragtag group of professionals. We just do stuff and we're good at it. <laughs> I don't know how we managed to do all this. Our organization. Um, that's the word. That's the key word for organization. Yes, yes. We're totally grassroots. I mean, we have no money, like not a dollar, like literally. And we don't take any donations. Um, and so what we do ask people to do are calls to action. They join our Facebook page um, and also our um, Reclaim Our Park resolution. They sign up for that. They will be added to an email list. And on that email list, we have calls to action. And calls to actions are essentially asking you to call particular people, email particular people, and give your voice. So we give voice and ask to influence the situation and reason with people. That's what this is really about. Our, um, our motto is healing, transformation, and progress. And that is exactly what we do. And we're constantly moving towards progress. And I would say to people, to particularly people who are in the South, um, and I want people to think about that because when you're in small towns and you got like in, Clark like in Crawford where my family's from and you got these Confederate monuments or you're in Lawrenceville or, you know, Macon or even small and small, small towns, you're sitting there looking at this stuff. You're looking at symbols of white supremacy and you probably feel overwhelmed because you're in a smaller area where people aren't urban and outspoken like Atlanta and you feel alone. And so I say that's important for us to network and it's important for us to look at people who have been successful and to repeat that success. And everything starts small. Find other like-minded people, create, um, you know, connected uh, organizations and then connect some more and connect some more. And then you will find the support you need when you live in a, in a more rural area or when you live in a place where there's very few people who think like you. But change is possible. I saw what was done in Decatur was just the community and the government that came together. And then they did it in Athens and they're working on it in Augusta. And everywhere you look around, they're using the same thing, Lawrenceville, Douglas, right? Mm -hmm. um, Rockdale, Conyers. I mean, it's spreading like wildfire. And it's just that people are connecting and asking, how did you do it? How can I do it? Can you help me? And so, you know, that's how change happens. One community at a time. And see, that's the beautiful thing about about Georgia and how I do appreciate our former mayors and enticing 
all the the companies now to come here from it being a tech place now to it being just a, this steam in general your science technology engineering and math is huge for media for movie productions and things of that nature so with all of those production companies here and all those different the artists and everything here now is the state has become very diverse and it's not just isolated to atlanta like even where we from in Macon, Macon has become diverse. Cause I, I remember growing up in Macon, man, it was just white and black. <laughs> you didn't see, you didn't see no Hispanic people. You didn't see no Asian people, it was just white and black. And you knew what part of the city you could go into in Macon and what part you had to stay in being a black person. Mm -hmm. But now in Macon, you see all type of different nationalities down there. And I'm trying to figure out what you're working Tony, at. But you still see it only in certain areas in certain spots. And that's what we gotta overcome. You know, we do, we, I think about I never really go back home. Unfortunately, I have to go home this weekend for something tragic. But, you know, I, I've been that's something that's been bothering me. Like, how can I really go back and support my community? What are some things that I need to do? How can I raise the consciousness of, of motivating them to not necessarily move out of their communities? Because we knew that we had to leave. I, I was raised to leave that place in order to make it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what I was taught. I was mm. taught, my mom told us that. When you all leave to go to college, my brother and I, whatever you do, don't come back here. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, that's, oh my God, it was bad. And so now I see that majority of us who are doing well, we left. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like because we left, and it's a few of us, we've been talking about doing something more positive and inspiring. And because we left, you do only see a lot of the older generation who are still in the fight, the Harriet Tubman Museum, you don't get to see that younger middle class generation because we said, we can't deal with y'all. And we need to move away <laughs> in order to take care of our family, to live good. I'm just keeping it real. But that particular group of individuals that's growing up now, they're suffering because they don't get to see the Tamika Days of the world. They don't get to see the Miss Freeman. They don't get to see the Antonio Hicks and say, if you all can make it, I can make it. But how do I make it where I am? Because I didn't go to college. I'm not able to leave. You know, I didn't go to college and stay away. So I do feel that sense of obligation to say, hey, look at me. I am from here. And even when I met some students at an event in Atlanta and they was from Macon, I was like, I was one of the speakers and I was like, oh, I'm from Macon. And they was like, oh, real? Yeah. It was like they had seen the ghost because they don't get to see a lot of professional African-American people that's doing it, that own their businesses. So that's where I just feel like we just have to, you know, stay aware, stay conscious, you know, mm -hmm. we still are fighting the fight. Um, being able to use our voice. Don't think just because we're out in these rural areas and our houses are big that we're still not fighting. Um, I had to speak on a city council meeting about two or three weeks ago because they thought it was okay to put a liquor store across the street from my house. It was not okay. So we, so it did not pass. So even though there's different levels to it, you're still constantly fighting, you know, and you're still constantly speaking up. And that's so I love what you all are doing in the suit. Um, you know, and showing up differently. But once again, Tony, it goes back to Tony, we always talk about it. I'm the kind of shirts and collar and Tony, like hood it up, like what? <laughs> Been there, done that. Been there, done that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but, but, but you see how they perceived you and they received you differently. Mm -hmm. So we do have to know when to turn it off. Oh off. yeah, absolutely know how to show up when we are engaging with different audiences so thank you for showing up and we appreciate your time and do you have anything you want to say in closing um before we wrap it up and absolutely you so nice to meet you absolutely nice to meet you as well yeah i had two quick thoughts uh antonia was talking about diversity and i totally tamika i'm going to really process what that means to to leave from a place and kind of, you know, almost take your genius away from that environment. I'm going to process and think about that a little bit. Um, but and Antonio brought up a, a something interesting about the diversity. And see, that goes back to that white supremacy, because you have Asian folk now who are having to maybe for the first time in a long time recognize that white supremacy kicks ass and, and, and takes names. Yeah. OK, 
And, and now, now they're starting to say, oh, wait a minute, there's hate. Well, let's follow that hate. Let's look a little deeper there. Because a lot of people want to act brand new like they never saw something before. Go ahead go ahead right. and finish that thought, Miss Freeman. I'm going to let you go ahead and finish that thought. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. A lot of All folks right. want to act brand new like they never saw anybody get their butt kicked or nobody killed or they haven't seen police brutality or just being attacked just because of your race. They're acting brand new mm. like they never saw it. See. And so there's something good that's happening in America only in the sense that people are all realizing that in that diversity, we got the same common struggle and it isn't gonna change until we we basically as a collective attack whiteness. So that's what I got. Mm. <laughs> Let the church say amen. <laughs> I was trying my hardest. Oh, Lord knows I was trying my hardest not to say that. Cause it's like you said, everybody, when the when the when did when the fire come up to your door, now you want to get brand new. Oh, it was a fire down the street. I didn't realize all this was going on. Oh my God, we got to do something to put this fire out. But now the fire at your door burning your house down. Now you want to get up and be active and you asking for help. And I do not, and I'm saying that to say I do not condone violence and mistreatment upon any race, nationality, sexuality. I don't condone any of that. No. I'm a true believer of God and universe like you supposed to love everybody. And because we cannot get through this if we are not together. And just, I, to me, Kimmy said all the time, as much as we promote blackness on this show and black greatness, we cannot get through this fight if we are right. not together. At period. Period. There's nothing you can do to win on your own. No matter how great black people are, we cannot do this by ourselves because we need support from other people to help us in this battle. And the same as other nationalities, as we try to move throughout this nation here in the United States, we need support from everybody. But that does not mean that people were not complacent and quiet when we were going through our struggles and we getting hit over the head with bats and dogs being sick on us and, and, and gas being pumped down our face, they burning down our entire communities. We started our own investment companies and towns where we, we promoting black greatness and black unity and they demoralize us and, and painted us as terrorists. And I can get on my, my high horse and preach on this forever, but I'm glad, I am glad now. See, see 2020, it was an eye opener yes. for everybody. Yes. You thought you were safe and you was comfortable where you was living at. But 2020 showed you there ain't no wall that cannot be torn down by ignorance. Okay. okay. Not a single one. And when it knocks your wall down, now you can't get up and try to repair it and make it back the way it used to be. No, you need help from everybody. It needs to be different kinds of bricks in that wall to unify because steel ain't even strong without having other rocks mixed in with it. So, mm -mm. nope. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, I got on my little tangent. No, it was necessary. It is necessary. <laughs> it is necessary. <laughs> but yes, let, uh, let, let everybody know how they can reach you, you know, again, about what Smack is about and about what you are about, how they can reach out to you, any of your own personal social media outside of Smack, because I do think you are a phenomenal black queen yeah. and I love mm -hmm. what you are doing and the movement that you're doing and just the energy that you have. So yes, tell everybody how they can connect with you and then, you know, how they can get involved. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So Smack, um, we're on social media in terms of, let's see, uh, LinkedIn. We're on social media, Facebook, Instagram, as well as Twitter. Um, please go to our website, www.stonemountainaction.org. Uh, and you will um, be able to look at all of our media past things that we have done. Um, you will also be able to reclaim our park, look at our plan to change the park. And you can see a lot of different things that will help you um, as like a toolkit to help you understand the history of the park as well. So it's also an educational tool. Um, we are going to have a, a call to action soon. We're going to basically have a parade um, because the, the Confederates have decided that they want to have a parade. So we're going to have one too <laughs> on the 17th, I believe it is, of, of April. And um, basically our cars will be uh, pasted inside with um, signs of truth. This is our part. The Confederacy doesn't live here, et cetera, et cetera. And so in the safety of your car and COVID free, we will basically uh, go around the park and it's only probably going to be five miles per hour. So we will be noticed. And they have some kind of bicycle gang that they have to, uh, of Confederates that are coming to the park um, soon. And they do have a permit for that. Um, 
But yes, Smack is here to take back uh, the park from the Confederacy. This is our park. It's not their park. The state married the Confederacy and the Klan a long time ago. And what we are going to do is demand the divorce. And it is upon us. Uh, the good news is um, that we have gotten word that those Confederate flags are going to be coming down more towards the end of April. So we have been effective. Um, and this is at the state level. I won't say anybody's name because he's not to be spoken of. But um, there's also a change in power and all the media will be there to see this. Um, the person who was the former chairman of the board of the Stone Mountain Memorial Association defied basically and said he refuses to take down these uh, Confederate flags and will not commit to changing the signs and the names like uh, General you know, E. Lee Boulevard and all this type of stuff. And he was basically fired. And you could only imagine how full of glee my heart is to find out that one of the black board members of the SMMA will now become the chairman. That's oh, change. change. Mm. Wow. Yes. Awesome work. We applaud you for everything that you're doing and for being so being so professional and persistent. That's what I like about it. Because sometimes right. we do have to rally and we do have to use our voice, but it's nothing like an educated woman on the front lines who's getting things done. So Antonio loves for us to wrap up with something positive and something inspirational so once again i am tamika day that's how you can reach me on all social media platforms hashtag success is my superpower and everybody was talking about women's history month women's history month you have just proven is every month and every day so i want to leave you all with a quote by mary mcleod bethune it says a woman is free if she lives by her own standards and create her own destiny if she prizes her individuality and puts no boundaries on her hopes for tomorrow. So you are definitely a woman who puts no boundaries and we love it. So thank you for being on the show. Ronio, it's on you. I'm gonna give Ms. Freeman an uh, opportunity if you want to leave a word of encouragement to inspire those that come from your hometown, how they can be just like you and be as active as you are, if you want. Ms. Freeman, did we lose Ms. Freeman? I don't think so. Oh, well, we lost her. Go ahead. So, I, so I'm going to go back to that. You know, I encourage everybody to be their authentic selves, to always look to what's ahead of them and look what's around them and, and don't focus on what's in their community right now and some of the hate within their community if there's hate within your community be your true you because like tamika was saying earlier where she's the one in the suit and tie and i'm the one that's in like the hoodie and i'm comfortable and i relax and that's because i went down that path to you. be every what everybody projected me and thought they what they thought i should be and i saw that they got me nowhere and I, so now i'm like i'm being my true me this is who I am. I'm comfortable. I'm laid back and I have knowledge. And it doesn't mean that even when I'm like, like Miss May was saying, when I get into the boardroom, I know how to dress the part when it's time to play that part. But when I'm in my own area, in my own place of comfort, this is how I dress. I want to be relaxed. And sometimes I might have a hoodie on. Sometimes I might have a polo, polo on. Sometimes I might be in a button up shirt. So my thing is be your true you and let everybody see who your true you is. And that's the only way that people can love you. Because if you come to them in the rawness of who you are, they'll appreciate you more than you coming to them being in the image of somebody else. So I thank Miss May again, we lost her, but I thank Miss May again for being who she is and being the phenomenal queen that she is to get out and fight this good fight. I think Tamika, and, and as we wrapped up Black black Women, oh yeah, I might as well say Black Women History Month. With Women's History Month. <laughs> I do I do adorn and I do admire all the women that's out fighting this fight for the betterment of this society because we weren't, like I was saying in one of our previous shows, none of us, none of the men would even be here had it not been for a woman to, to lift him up and to bring them in. So I thank everybody again. I think we have Miss May back. I thank you all again for uh, tuning in. And Miss May, you here? Yes. So <laughs> I'm gonna ask you, I'm, I can edit this out. 
I'm going to ask you, did you want to leave with a word of encouragement for those within uh, your old community? It's just to give people some a reason. Well, they have a reason to be look up to you, but to inspire the youth. And I will say this before I let you on to that. I do think that we all that left our hometowns, our small towns, we do have a responsibility to be an example. Yes, you are. No matter what you're doing, if you left those small areas, you know there's not much opportunity there outside of niche fields. So you do have a responsibility to be an example and show them that there is a way out. Now, I don't care if you come from an urban neighborhood that was like a project area or you come from all rural area, there's nothing but just country and farmland. If you came out of that and you are doing well about yourself and only you can define success, but you do have a responsibility to be an example of those that are still back there to let them know that you don't have to be stuck in the past, that there is a way out and you can be successful if you if you flee the, the nest. But you also have a reason to come back and show them that there is something that they can do to be better. So I'm gonna leave it to you, Ms. Freeman, if you wanna leave with a word of encouragement. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that we, we as people, we need to have faith in the nobody. You know, the people who don't have, understand that people who don't have titles, who don't have positions, who don't have, um, you know, status in, in society and all of that. We, we, we need to believe in, the, in, in every, that everybody who's a nobody matters and that they can make all kinds of change in the world. And um, I just believe in the power of nobody. You can be somebody even when you're considered nobody without the titles, without all of those things. Um, and I think that's a misconception we have in America and in a lot of places, you know, you can't holler out your degrees and how many businesses you own and you, you don't have this title, that title, you're not sit sitting on some board that you don't matter, that you're a nobody, but there's power in the nobody. Every mm -hmm. person has that, you know, I say, this is a little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. I think that's what everybody needs to remember. Always. Thank you. Amen to that. Because even though you might be a nobody, you somebody to somebody. Somebody to somebody. <laughs> somebody to somebody. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Ms. Freeman, for being a guest on this show. We will have you back so we can hear more about the progress of what's taking place at Stone Mountain and what's the next move after that. So thank you again. Thank you, Tamika. Love you thank all you. for tuning in. And like I always say, happy podcasting.